Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy, and today is Tuesday, October 5th. We have plenty of content to discuss tonight because I've taken some some old ideas and kind of shoved them into this, this presentation tonight to talk about our topic, which is sibling trauma. I think it's one of the most um, oft-asked questions that I get from parents is how to support children, the non-identified patient at home or the one that's kind of uh, on the periphery of the, of the drama, of the family chaos, of the family pain, of the pain that, that the, the identified patient is both both feeling and in some ways creating. How do we support them? What do we do with that? So I'm going to jump right into it, into it with a couple of quotes that I, that I thought about today. This work, the work that we're, we're, we're doing here at Evoke with you, and these issues, they ask us to look deep at ourselves, to look deeply into ourselves and deeper into ourselves. And in this work, we are called to find our authentic selves and to learn how to sit with and foster this discovery in others. The circumstances from person to person, from issue to issue, differ greatly, but the task of being a person and loving an other are the same. What that quote means is the fundamental issues of what it means to be a person translate from situation to situation. But so often when I'm teaching and, and lecturing and talking, people want me to answer specific questions, which, which makes sense. They want me to, to address specific diagnoses, to, to address specific ages or, or genders. And the idea is that if you get the, the core principles, right, the core ideas, that you'll be able to translate them yourself. And so part of the work that I do is kind of giving people examples and talking through scenarios. But I'm really just trying to teach people how to think. And I get asked so often for answers and skills and tools when really the, the tool is to learn how to, how to think. And when I talk about how to think, I know this will sound uh, strange. I'm about to say something that will sound strange, but I really believe it. It's something that I'm thinking about more and more the older I get. That the work at Evoke, both for the identified patient um, and for the families that, that are left at home, is all the same work. And the tools, the ideas, the, the, the concepts, the insights that you develop in relationship to your child who's struggling have their application to your five-year-old at home, to your 16-year-old child who's the good child to the people that you work with to your siblings to your parents to your spouses and so forth and so on it's really about what it means to be a person and that's the strange thing that i i warned you about really what i'm teaching you and passing on to you is the, the information about what it means to be a human being and then the second thing the, the next step is what does it mean to be in a relationship to, to love another person and I just don't think that we were taught that. We, we, we weren't taught it because our parents didn't know. We were taught good and, and bad and, and right and wrong and success and failure. And, and, and we were taught all of those things, but we weren't taught about being a person. And a person is messy and, and complicated and, 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 and a work in progress. And I don't think we have a lot of experience with that. We can learn in this work to avoid getting distracted by the noise long enough to see the task at hand. Mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, 18-year-old, 5-year-old, eating disorder, autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, on and on and on. Those are just the details that distract us from the core issues and the core tasks about selfhood, and, and boundaries, what it means to be a person and what it means to be related to another another human being. So when parents ask questions about the non-identified patient, I'll often remind them, you're, 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 you're going to be using the same skills, the same tools that you're learning for your identified patient, for the child that's in treatment. And that's how to listen, how to contain. And contain is a, a clinical term that just refers to being able to manage your own reactions, your own triggers, your, your own feelings, 
well enough that you can hold space. You know, keep your mouth closed and listen and respect and honor what somebody has to say to you. I, I can't place too much emphasis on this. This goes for your children at home, your children who, who might be in treatment, and it goes for you. The risk of speaking the truth to authority figures in our lives it is pretty great. We expect to be wounded. We expect to be shut down. We expect to be punished. We expect to be dismissed. We expect it, expect it to not be safe. Actually, most people don't even consider all of that. They just go about their business talking to people and relating to people and don't look at the finer points that I'm discussing here tonight. But once we get into this work a little bit, we realize how rare it is that somebody can contain us that somebody has the capacity to contain us. We, we might realize how rare it is for us to be able to speak our authentic truth and feelings without apologizing or justifying. I saw during the pandemic, I saw as, as social justice issues become much more at the forefront and rightly so, I cannot tell you how many people, clients, in all the settings that I work therapeutically will say to me, I know other people have it, worse than I do, or I know that I'm a white male or a white female. And therefore I don't really have a right to complain about my pain or my distress or my discomfort. And, and what they're communicating very clearly is that the world doesn't feel very safe to them. You know, I, I happen to be a white male, right? I have all of the, the kind of built in privileges because of my race and my gender on planet Earth and in, in North America, in the United States. I have a lot of advantages. And I have lots of pain and sadness and grief and difficulty and distress and anxiety. And the one place that I can go and talk to it each week is to my therapist because she doesn't shut me down. She doesn't tell me that I could be grateful or recognize my privilege or be grateful for all the advantages that I have, right? I don't get shut down in that way. The core task translates and generalizes to other relationships. When I learn what it means to be a person and relate to another person, I can deal with somebody on the spectrum. I can deal with somebody that's 30 years old or 40 years old or 80 years old or two years old. Because the, the, the principles, the ideas, where I begin and, and the other person ends or where I end and the other person begins, is the same in all these equations. I then know how to respond to distress, to pain, to sadness, to blame, to anxiety, to, to, to symptoms, right? And so part uh, at the outset tonight is to say, the principles that I'm going to talk to you about tonight are, are the same with the child at home as they are with the child in treatment. And, and parents ask us so much. We, Malia and I talked about that. Malia is my moderator. We talk about this at other times. People are constantly asking me for, for support for siblings. I, I answered it on the, on the question and answer broadcast just the other night. And I said, really what people are asking for is how, how do they show up in a way that's helpful with, with the sibling? How do you hold space for a 22-year-old who, who's come home from college and is still being triggered when the identified patient who now they themselves are, are living in mainstream society, 24, 25 years old. But when they have a down day that that 22 year old feels triggered. How do I, what do I say to them? How do I support them? It's the same exact principles that you'll recognize when you were working with your child in treatment, right? You listen, you, you're not too quick to fix. You own and manage your own triggers that, that prevent you from listening. You offer gently some ideas or suggestions that have worked for you. When they are rejected, you drop them quickly because you're not attached to them. And I'll get into some of the more specific details as we go on tonight. But the principle is, it's all the same work. No matter, no matter who the qualifier is, if it's your alcoholic wife or husband, or your alcoholic son or daughter, or your sober son or daughter, 
or your sober wife or husband. It's all the same work. One of the questions I get asked most often is how can I get my, my partner? How can I get my, my child who's at home to go to therapy? The first thing we have to identify is whose issue is it? Yes, a child is anxious. Yes, a, a child is experiencing some distress because they've lived in the wake of this identified patient's behavior. But that's not broken. There's nothing broken that needs fixing there. What it needs is to be held and to be heard. I know I've said this in, in the recent weeks, but if you want an example about how to be there for the non-identified patient, watch Mr. Rogers. He was broadcasting Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. He was broadcasting to the general population, right? He was talking to, to every family, every child. He was talking about race and, and, and disability and anger and sadness and loss. And he was just teaching children how to feel. He was teaching people how to be people, how to be a person. And he was showing us what it looks like when somebody understands their, their, the, the true nature of their relationship to another person. So we have to first under, under, understand, yes, my child is anxious or, or it has, has some distress in the wake of the, the, the problems that our family has been experiencing. But do they need fixing or help or do I need help at holding space for them? At being able to hold healthy boundaries with them without letting my guilt compromise me? At being able to, to deeply listen and hear without dismissing or, or, or erasing their feelings? Uh, you know, this will sound almost, it could even sound unkind, what I'm about to say. But it's true. If if we all, we parents, I'm a parent. I, I identify these days more as a parent than I do as, as a child, although I'm both, of course, um, the child of a parent. Um, if we can learn to own our anxiety to make that our project, I cannot tell you the difference that it'll make in our children. The non-identified patient oftentimes takes on the parent's anxiety because they want to be the good one because they saw the distress that the identified patient created. And they love their parents and they're able to manage things a little bit better behaviorally than their brother, their sister, their sibling. And so they learn to be the good one because they take on the parents' anxiety. If parents, if I could say something very general and vague to all of you, I would say just admit that you have an anxiety disorder and tell your children and your spouse and your, and your close family, your close circle, about it and tell them that you're working on it. And then everything else will make a lot more sense after that. But because we as human beings don't like to own our inadequacies, right? We don't like to own our, our limitations. We make other people the problem. My child at home is having the problem. My child in treatment is having the problem. My spouse at home is having the problem. But if we learn to own our anxiety and say, I have an anxious reaction to my child's anxiety. I have an anxious reaction to my child's pain. I have an anxious child, an, an anxious response to my husband or my wife's or my spouse's distress. And I don't know how to cope with that. So I'm going to go to treatment and work on it. I'm going to lean on somebody who hopefully can show me what it looks like to be held. And I can use that to go back to my husband, to my wife, to my son, to my daughter, to my child, to my friend. And I can do for them what it has been done for me. Owning your anxiety. I'm, I'm even using the word anxiety disorder just for a fact, just to get your attention. Own your anxiety disorder. And when you do that, then your children can work on their stuff. But if they have to own your anxiety, which, by the way, you will defend to the end because your child is cutting on themselves, not getting along with peers, not going to school, using substances, eating too much, eating too little, acting out, getting arrested. You know, these are all legitimate reasons to have anxiety. So you think to yourself, well, it's my child getting arrested that's causing me anxiety or my child cutting on themselves that's causing my anxiety or my child's using opiates that's causing me anxiety. So I'm going to work on changing all of those people so then I don't feel anxious. 
It's still your responsibility. Your serenity, your anxiety is your responsibility. Your peace of mind and your happiness is your job, your responsibility, not your child's. I, I said recently, I wrote something that said, if we show up to a, a relationship or to a conversation from a place of should, we should show up, we should be able to listen. When we're not able to, when we can't, we will end up abusing the other person or ourselves. I'll say that again. If we show up to relationships, situations, conversations, because we should, to be a good wife, to be a good husband, to be a good mother, father, friend, daughter, son. If we show up to these, these conversations and situations to be good because we should, and, and, and we can't, we don't have the capacity, we will abuse them or we will abuse ourselves. And so the shift in psychology, this is one of the secrets of the universe. The six, the shift in psychology then is moving our energy and our mindset from should and shouldn't to can and can't. Just that shift changes so many things. It creates a cascade uh, of new insight and new awareness. So we learn to be patient when we can. We allow our children to hold a boundary and we deal with our anxiety. You know, the child at home, I'll say this because this is kind of the, the main point of the, the sibling. Part of them not wanting to talk to us or not engage or not go to therapy, part of it is they've already experienced a loss of control in the trauma that the identified patient and all the conflict around the identified patient created in them. They've already experienced trauma and a loss of control. And so when we are trying to force them into, coerce them into getting into therapy or talking about it, we are re-injuring, re-traumatizing them. Now, if a child starts to act out, that's a different story, right? If they start, if they themselves start to develop symptoms, then becoming more active is fine. But outside of the symptoms, you know, just being mopey or sad or quiet or close, it's really important that we learn to honor that, to give them the space, even to respect the fact that they're standing up to authority, which, which, which is us, right? We, uh, we want to give our children a, a pretty consistent experience that it's safe to stand up to authority. It doesn't work in the classroom, doesn't work at work, doesn't work if you get pulled over by a police officer, but those aren't our intimate relationships. In real relationships, we want to make it safe for our children to tell us the truth about how they're feeling and what they're thinking. I think a way to get children into therapy without making it about them is ask them to come to therapy to help you. That's not a trick. That's not a sleight of hand, right? That's in essence what you're asking for. Come to therapy to help me. I'm feeling distress at what appears to be your anxiety. So I need you to come. I'm asking you to come to help me deal with my anxiety, not your anxiety. That's, in fact, that's your life and your job. I said to my daughter the other day, after she made a, a choice that there were some consequences that we gave her. And, you know, I sat down with her and I said, again, you have to figure this out. I cannot figure it out for you. You have to figure out how to deal with your feelings. I can talk to you about it. I can share how I've sorted it out. I can even share where I struggle with dealing about feeling, dealing with feelings, but you're going to have to figure it out. So ask the people in your life to come to therapy to, to help you and then follow through on that invitation by owning it and making the session yours. You bring your co-parent because you're feeling distressed and upset that you're not on the same page. Bring them and then talk about your distress and your upset and let the therapist help you work through it. If we bring people to therapy to change them, to fix my child's anxiety or to fix my, my co-parents, um, aloofness, we're asking the therapist to do something in my opinion, that's not their job. 
which is to change an unwilling participant. I think it's valuable to share with your children how much you struggle with all of it. If your child is being triggered by the identified patient, talk about your triggers. If your child is struggling with peer pressure or anxiety or not wanting to talk, give examples where you feel and respond the same ways. Don't talk about how you've got it. It's so much more valuable to give your story, to give examples, to, 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 to lower the defenses. It's so much more valuable to tell your children's stories where you haven't figured it out yet. You know what will happen? You can see the wheels go in motion. They'll start to solve the problem for you, and they'll start to give you advice because, of course, they've learned from the best, right? So instead of giving your child who's struggling with peer pressure a lecture about peer pressure, talk about how you worry about judgment and how you still struggle with body image or anxiety or whatever it is. And then watch your child feel safe and open up. Give you a pep talk. Share your struggles as much as your solutions. It's also okay to share solutions. But 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 honestly, that's really the default for most parents. And it feels very dismissive. And it suggests to the child that the problem is easy to solve. And these are not, learning how to live a, a meaningful life is not an easy thing to solve or to figure out. You can share with them the resources that you have at Evoke, the broadcasts, the podcasts, books that you or your child... Uh, that's in treatment are reading or have read letters and assignments if they're interested if it's appropriate obviously there could be some things communicated between you and your identified patient that wouldn't be appropriate to share but some of the general education psychoeducation skills tools and insights that's something you can share with them you know traditional psychotherapy is for those who think that they need it or or that, that want it you can't be compelled or shamed or, or threatened into it. I mean, I guess those things can happen, but it, it's so hard to be a client. And it's really hard to be a client when you don't think you need it. So when your child gets to the point that they get to it, evoke, see, see evoke therapy programs and wilderness therapy programs, it's not just outpatient therapy. It's an intervention. It's structured. It's contained. It has behavioral components that kind of keep the symptoms, the, the child safe and keep the symptoms at bay and kind of funnel the, the child's energy and discussion into talking about their feelings. And then we do psychotherapy. But, but wilderness therapy is not the same as outpatient psychotherapy. Explain to siblings what, what wilderness therapy is. It is an outdoor program that, that on top of on top of that, we, we do psych traditional psychotherapy. And it's in the context of, of small group living, nomadic living, primitive living, at least at Evoke, where we learn to, to communicate, to problem solve, to deal with frustration. You know, when I'm out there, every one of your wilderness therapists would say this to you. When we are out there and it's raining or snowing or freezing or windy or blowing over our tarp or it's wet, it's difficult. Dare I say miserable at times. But part of what we're, what we're doing is we're learning how to feel. We're learning how to be present. We're learning how to deal with what's outside of our control. You know, in AA, they talk about the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And in wilderness therapy, there's a lot outside of your control. You can't control, you can't control the mosquitoes. You can't control the hot summer days and the cold winter months. You can't control the rain. I remember being in the wilderness with my son after having been a wilderness therapist for over 12 years. And then I think it was 10 years. And then sitting in, in, in the tent where it was raining and 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 the rain was getting in the way of of our, our of our family visit. At least that's the way that I thought of it. And I remember thinking at one point, like I often realize, is this is my therapy. At home, I'm always in control. I'm always on top of it. And I can't control the rain, and I have to deal with it, and see how it comes out. See see how it comes out in me. 
therapy, you know, when should siblings, siblings be involved? I mean, that's really dictated by the therapist, but we start off with mom and dad or, or the primary caregivers, you know, it could be stepmom, stepdad, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever the primary caregivers are. We start off with a narrow focus. That's our default. That's the rule. And, and then from there, based on how the tr child is doing, we open it up to extend it, you know, to, to the immediate family, to siblings. Sometimes siblings are asked to write a letter early on in the process because the treatment team and the parents think that that's a going to be a supportive and helpful ac activity for them to write a letter, both for themselves and for the child. We don't force it. It's not a requirement for the non-identified patient. I mean, part of the idea that, that happens is when you're the, the non-identified patient, you've kind of earned the right not to, not to be forced to participate in therapeutic activities, I think. Right? Look, I'm managing my life. I'm not cutting on myself or, or skipping school or abusing substances. So I just want to be a kid. I just want to live my life. So we start off narrow. We expand it as we think it's helpful or necessary. And, and we don't force people that are un, uninterested into doing their work so that it makes us feel better. You know, when I, when I explain to people about this, this narrow to broad focus, it's like, it's like somebody getting in a car accident. You know, you get in a car accident, they wheel you into the trauma room, the emergency room, and they don't let the parents stay. They don't let the siblings visit. They're, they're in the way during that stabilization process. After the, the, the patient is stabilized, then they can have one or two visitors, right? Maybe one at a time or two at a time. And usually it's close family. Once they, they, they stabilize even more, they move into a different part of the hospital where lots of people can visit them. Part of, of the intervention at Evoke is to, to, to narrow the focus. Narrow the treatment focus so that we can address it because people are so good at getting distracted and then looking for um, other things to focus on. So that's the justification. And the other justification is we believe because of psychology and science and child development and everything that every, everybody knows that, that, that development, especially from that 13 to 25 year span, kind of intensely focused during that span, that the job is to become an individual, become who you are, and that intimacy comes after that. Even when I do couples therapy or when I do family therapy, I, I spend some time focusing on each individual first, even when people are not acute, even when somebody's just coming to improve their marriage or communi improve communication in their family. I'm going to start off with one at a time, helping each person kind of find themselves, find their voice. And then we work on communication and then we work on relationship dynamics. The problem is with most Americans, and, and I think it's true of most men, I can say that because I'm a man. Um, I think we go to intimacy too quickly. I think we go to int intimacy to define ourselves. We run away from mom and dad and we find uh, our partner, our romantic partner, without giving us time to kind of be ourselves. We don't go to the movies or the theater by ourselves. We don't go to dinner by ourselves. We don't do solos by ourselves. So it, there's justification for that, that separation as a, a kind of structural way of emphasizing our belief in science that suggests to us that identity, identity comes before intimacy. And if you move to intimacy before identity, how can there be intimacy when, when a person's selfhood is undefined? You know what they do every day? I have broadcasts. I'm not going to go over the schedule now. I have broadcasts on wilderness therapy and what they do. You can share that with the child. I have a slide that I often share during those broadcasts. It's camping, group therapy, school assignments, right? Fun games, all that stuff. You can, you can share that with them. Um, if they want to write, if they're really feeling compelled to write, 
let them write a letter and then give it to the therapist and let the therapist use it at their discretion when the time is right. But, but it's okay to tell the child at home, we're going to take this in a very deliberate order. I, I say this about a lot of things. You deserve to ask intelligent questions. Excuse me. You deserve to ask questions, difficult questions, and to receive intelligent answers. And I think your children do too. So when they ask, why can't I write? We can say to them, he needs to focus on himself right now. Eventually, we're going to introduce more and more of the family and more and more relationships. I don't like to compel non-identified patient children to write. I just think it robs them of time for them to take care of themselves. I think, again, it's another way of inviting them into a treatment process that they didn't sign up for or have any control over. You know, we can, we can argue that the identified patient had some control over being sent to a VOC. I'll talk a little bit later about the fact that ultimately it is your choice, but for adolescents. Um, but the fact of the matter is the, the non-identified patient doesn't have a choice. The evoke client, we could argue, does because he or she or they are making choices that, that kind of require or, or ask of us for an intervention like this. But to compel a sibling because it would make you feel comfortable because you don't know what's going on inside of their head and that causes you anxiety and distress, to compel them to write is not appropriate. Now, if I were dealing with you one-on-one -on -one and you said, well, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to argue with you. You can do whatever you want. But when I do podcasts or broadcasts like this, I can talk about ideals in ways that I can't talk about in one-on-one -on -one therapy. Sometimes they're embarrassed. Again, there's so much about the sibling or the family member that, that's, that's adjacent to the identified patient where they've lost control over their own story their own lives, their own space. You know, if, they, if they're in the same school as the identified patient, other people in school are going to find out that, that their sibling is in treatment. And all of a sudden, their space psychologically is invaded. They can't walk around with anonymity. Now, we all could argue, well, it's healthy and there should be no st you know, stigma with mental health. And all of that's fine and good. But it still doesn't mean that, that we should compel people to, to open up to people, to expose themselves to people. I actually, and I'm ashamed of this, I feel so sad about this. I actually used to out people in my life and in therapy because I, I justified it by saying, well, there's no shame. We should just be who we are. But I didn't realize for a long time how abusive that was. And how it's, it's, it's nobody's right to out somebody else, whether it be their sexual orientation, their mental health issues, or, or their symptoms. Obviously, missing them can be a part of it. And that's where, you know, some of those writers, those, those, those tender letters that, that siblings write to their siblings in the wilderness can be very touching and compelling. Can even provide some fuel for the child to do work so that they can be home again. You know, I used to say to parents all the time, don't rub their nose in it, but don't hide the fact that you're having holidays and celebrations and births and weddings, graduations. Don't rub their nose in it, but don't hide it either because we want your children to want to be home, right? If it's a healthy thing for them. We want them to want their life back. And this relatively temporary time in treatment is a chance to get themselves well, to, to, to heal and to be able to go back home for the next wedding. I used to always say, I don't care about Thanksgiving or the December holidays of 2021. I really don't. When I'm talking about children in our program, I care about 2022, 23, 24, 25. I know as a father and as a clinician, I'm willing to sacrifice this holiday if it means that the, the next 10 will be better. So missing them is painful emotions in anybody is not a broken thing. 
even if those painful d- f- feelings are directed at you, I'm mad you sent my brother or sister away. I'm mad that this is your solution, mom and dad. That's not broken. That's something that they have to feel and and move through and experience and integrate. Somebody asked me in preparation for this, what if the what if the sibling I talk about all the time that really the, your children will come home, your your adolescent children will come home when you're ready for them. And not a day or or an hour before. When they come home, it's because you're ready. Then people say, well, what if they're ready before you are? And the answer is they'll come home when you're ready. When you've decided, given all the information, how you're doing, how they seem to be doing, all the professional input, when you decide that you're ready to have them home, they will come home. If they're a young adult, it's a little bit different because they can walk away at any time. But, But back into your home, it's the same equation. What if the sibling isn't ready for them to return is the question. And I think that's a fair one. I think that deserves some consideration and some work. Now, if the sibling says, well, I don't want them home, period, and I'm not willing to write a letter or do any work around it, my decision is going to change versus if somebody says, hey, uh, I haven't talked to them and I will go to therapy and I will write a letter. And I will start to sort out my feelings and what I need in this relationship. That's a different, that's a different equation. So I think it, it deserves consideration if the sibling hasn't worked through anything and they're willing to, or says they're not, they're not ready, but, but is not willing to work. That's a, that's a very different equation. You know, the child contributed to your decision to send you to, to, to your child contributed to to your decision to send them to wilderness. But it is your responsibility if they're an adolescent, if they're under 18. And it's okay to own it. It's just, I'm thinking about this and it's, it's, I've had, this is the fifth time I've talked about ownership today. We just don't learn how to own our stuff own our feelings, own our choices. We want to blame other people for how we feel, how we're doing, even the choices we make. I do not like it when therapists say to adolescent students, you chose to be here with your behavior. My response is sort of. There are other people doing worse than me that don't get sent here. Right? And I'm better than some of the people here, and some of the people here are doing better than I am in life, managing better. We, we model accountability by owning, I sent you there. Yes, your behavior was concerning. Yes, my therapist or my educational consultant or my trusted friend or, or sponsor or mentor did give me advice, but I ultimately am the one legally and and... and really had the choice to send you. It's not about being right or justifying your decision. That's the shift that we make in psychotherapy as we grow, right? We don't have to be right anymore or justify ourselves. We just get to be ourselves. All the wars, all the conflicts that are fought over both sides thinking that they are right. You get to be you. You get to decide. Even if I disagree with it, you get to decide it. Even if your consultant disagrees with you, you you get to decide. You must decide. If all of your children, if your parents disagree with you, you you get to do it. Now, if I'm doing good therapy with you, I support you getting to decide. I might challenge some of your thinking, ask you some questions, ask you to look deeper. That's part of the process of self exploration, right? But ultimately, at the end of the day, taking on the decisions for your life and your family are too much of a responsibility for me to to carry. I can't. I can give my thoughts, my opinions, ask my questions, but you have to decide. And you don't have to be right. And you don't have to prove it to anybody. You don't have to prove it to your mom and dad. 
You don't have to prove it to your 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 friends or your siblings who tell you, well, if you just love them, if you just have consistent boundaries, everything would be okay. I don't think you should send your son or your daughter away because that's not how you deal with problems. You get to decide. And then ultimately you get to decide to cut those people out of your life, at least for the time being, if they're going to lecture you on the way you should live your life. I, I've thought about this a lot today. I don't think many of us know how to just sit and listen to another person. We're too triggered and we feel entitled to our triggers. Right? You say something that I don't agree with. You some part of your narrative about me I disagree with or or paints me in a really negative light. I'm entitled to respond to you. I'm entitled to share my anger, my hurt, my rage at you for misrepresenting the story or misrepresenting me. As we develop greater capacity, as we do our work, as we do our work, you guys, we parents, we take care of ourselves so that we can be there for the people that we love and listen well. I was telling somebody today, my wife is not up to the task of taking care of me 24 seven. She just can't do it. And I'm not up for the task of taking her care of her 24 seven or even my children 24 seven. So as a result of that, that lack of capacity, I go to therapy. I go to therapy to bitch, to complain, to blame, to rage, to cry, to be sad, to be distressed, to be worried. And luckily, because I have an adequate therapist who understands what therapy is, she sits there on the other side of the, the, the couch. Right now it's virtual. And she listens. For 22 years, she listens. And in the process of being heard and seen, I become more of myself, more authentic, more capable of loving my children more capable of loving my wife, more, more effective at loving myself, which is the, the primary piece. We learn to listen. One of my favorite quotes that I've been using a lot in the last year is what Einstein said when he said, um, he said, you cannot solve a problem in the same level of consciousness in which the problem was created. This work asks us to go to the next level, right? To understand ourselves and, and others, like I said early on, more deeply. And so we don't explain ourselves anymore. We know, we know it. You know, when I talk to you and I teach you about things, ideas, what I'm saying to you is this is for you. You're okay. You're okay. And if you can internalize that and, and believe that you're okay, you won't explain yourself to other people. Differentiated, mature people don't explain themselves to people. They, they set their boundaries and they let other people be really upset and confused by it. We over-identify with our children's pain. The, the, the most difficult thing for most parents is to hear a, a child that, that, that's suffering in one way or the other. It makes sense that that's part of our evolutionary, the quality of, of our evolution, right? Is that we, we respond and take care of our young, right? But sometimes it's overdeveloped. Sometimes it's misguided. And sometimes we think that, that, that every pain is life-threatening, right? I used to say to people, you know, let your child fall down, trip over a, a stair, but let, let, don't let them fall down a flight of stairs if you can help it. We learn to have a different relationship with our pain first. And when we learn to process and have a different relationship with our pain, we then have a different relationship with, for, with our children's pain. Um, 
What can we do to prepare the siblings for the return of the child? You can have some family meetings, some family groups, some family discussions. You can invite the child, the non-identified patient, to, to therapy and, and, and not put them on the spot, the hot seat, like I was mentioned earlier, but say, these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. This is the way that we're going to be talking. If you want to participate, you can. If not, you can sit quiet and listen, but, but we can do that. Like I said, somebody wrote this question earlier today. You often mention that it's not only about whether the child's ready to come home, but it's also about whether the parents are ready. Does this extend to the siblings? What if the sibling is not ready? Like I said, I think that deserves some consideration. Some, some, to offer them some resources and some time to get ready. If they're not willing, if they're not ready and they're not willing to do anything, like I said earlier, that's a different equation. It's okay to ask questions of me and the therapist. Say, what, what would you say to your child if they said this? What might you say? What does one say? Um, especially for the identified patient. But remember, really what I'm doing when I'm answering your question about how to talk to the sibling, I, I'm teaching you a skill so that you can manage your own anxiety and distress. I'm teaching you to take care of yourself. It's really important to realize that that you know, there, there's a, a story, which I'm sure, even if you're not a Christian, you've probably read the story of the 99 and one sheep, right? That Jesus goes after the one sheep. Or or the even the, the story of the prodigal son is probably a better example. Where when the prodigal son returns, the, the father throws a party. And the one that's been there all along says, just like this bullet point here on my slide, like, what about me? You never threw a party for me. And the father says something like, well, all I had was yours all along anyway. I'm just celebrating the return of your son because he was lost and now he's found. But I, I think the scriptures aren't very therapeutically savvy. I don't think they really do well to hear what it's like for the non-identified patient and the story of the prodigal son. How really the, the, the attention has been robbed from them. You know, when, when a child is struggling in a life-threatening or, or, or at least a quality-of-life-threatening situation, parents will tell you they'll virtually do anything to save that child's life. And sometimes that means that it's going to cost time and attention for the other siblings. You can't fix that. But you can be there for it when the non-identified patient, uh, non-identified sibling says, you abandoned me. And you can say, I did. What I don't want you to say is, I would do it again. Or here's why I did it. If you understood what it was like to be a father or a mother, you would get why I did what I did. You don't say that. You know that. Do you see the difference between that? If you have to say it, you're trying to convince somebody else. You're trying to convince yourself. If you know it, you don't need to say it. Isn't that the magic of it? If you know that you're okay, you don't have to talk as much. Sometimes the, the, the child at home experiences a lot of peace. Sometimes the focus turns on them and they become the identified patient. It's really important to understand, to develop a, a, a sensibility, to understand what the symptoms are trying to tell us, right? I just gave an in-service to our therapist this morning and I said the same thing that I say to you. Stop focusing on good and bad behavior, right and wrong behavior, and try to understand. And I want to say something because I see some of my old friends on here. There are problems in life that are unsolvable. There just are. There's never enough time. People have health problems. People die. Some cars only go 55 miles an hour and there's nothing you can do. And so really we're learning to be present in all of those uncomfortable, 
painful, difficult, unsolvable problems. I've, I've shared with you on a couple of occasions when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis back in 2015, I think it was November of 2015, I called an acquaintance who actually had two members of his family who have MS, and he wasn't my best friend. He was actually um, a lot younger than me, and I said to him, I don't know why I'm calling you, but I just found out 15 minutes ago that I have MS. And this this 26-year-old young man said to me, you're not alone, and you never will be. And I'm here for you. He didn't fix it. He had no lectures. There was no look on the bright side. He didn't talk about doctors that I should go to. He just said, I'm here with you. How profoundly deep is that? And, and by the way, it was exactly what I needed. I needed to not be alone in my grief. Multiple sclerosis is, as of today, is incurable. It's probably what's going to kill me. And it's in me right now. And there's nothing I can do about it. I could end my life. I guess I could do that. That's one way to get rid of it. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to learn to have a relationship with my own mortality. And I'm going to do it with people that can lit, listen and sit with me. Oftentimes, those are people who they themselves have had experience with MS, like my friend or loss. Just as a, as, a, as a kind of interesting trivia, I've never given him credit by name, but his name, the, boy, the, the, the young man that I called, his name is Tyler Osmond. He's actually the son of Alan Osmond, who famous, you know, one of the Osmond brothers who famously has multiple sclerosis, as does his older brother, Tyler's older brother. We practice the skills, whether you're practicing your skills in your letter or you're practicing the skills at home, it's all the same lesson. I said to a client recently, I said to my daughter, I said to my daughter, I said, look, if we were to place you in a treatment program, I know what they would tell us to do. Talk, listen, explore feelings, work on our boundaries, work on our self-care. I started, I, let's just do it now. Let's not wait to, to when or, or if you need treatment, let's work on it now. When I used to speak to elementary schools, I would say to them, I would often accept the invitation to speak to parents of younger children under the title of how to prevent your child from going to a wilderness program. And I would say to them, prevention is the same work as recovery and repair. If you folks walked into an Al-Anon meeting and just sat and listened. You would be learning the, the tools and the skills, the insights, the awarenesses of what it means to be in a relationship with other humans who are sometimes self-sabotaging or addicted or struggling with mental illness. And you're doing it in community and you're, you're getting a sense of love and belonging while grieving and working through some very difficult feelings. It's all the same work. And you don't have to have as many answers as you think. I promise. If all of this is depending on you having everything figured out, you're screwed. Another way of saying that is, I've spent the last 25 years of my life obsessed with child development, mental health, addiction, and parenting. I think about it all day, every day. And I still struggle and bumble my way through it. It's all the same work. When somebody comes back from an Al-Anon meeting and says, well, I didn't really relate to it because everybody there was talking about their alcoholic spouse. I want to say, go back and listen, listen more closely. L listen deeper because all they're doing is they're talking about how to be present with other people who are human. It's all the same. One of the things we have to come to terms with, if I could give you, 
if I could give you one idea, if I could magically give you this idea, it would be to accept your horrible, rotten self, to accept you are the devil, a bad guy, to, 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 to make peace with your horrible, rotten self. Because when you do, when you realize, when I realize, or in the moments that I realize, or in the moments you realize that the goal is not to be good, in fact, it's impossible, it's a fool's errand, you can love better. You can just imagine that if there were no value of, about being right or wrong or good or bad, and somebody got mad at you, it would be effortless to listen to them. And you would say, I said to somebody today, if you walked up to the Dalai Lama and you called him a turd, after he stopped laughing, two or three minutes after he stopped laughing, after calling him a turd, he would say, you have no idea what you've just touched upon. I think the same thing. I read a quote from Tolstoy the other day who said, everybody thinks about changing the world, but nobody thinks about changing themselves. Once you realize that you're a project, a human, imperfect, flawed, messy, work in progress who's bumbling through life, and you make peace with that, nobody can hold it against you. You don't lie to fit in or to belong. You don't withhold the truth to protect somebody, which is really protecting you. And you can listen much, much, much better. I wrote down some quote, some, some questions and responses from siblings that we sent out a while ago. What do you see in your role, if any, in your sibling's current enrollment? These are all questions asked of the non-identified patient at home. So the first question, what do you see as your role, if any, in your sibling's current enrollment? A male, 24 years old, three years older than the identified patient responded. I played a large part. I made it very clear to my parents that my brother needed serious help, help and got the name of Evoke from a friend. A 14-year-old um, younger sister said, a few weeks before my brother's departure to Utah, I too was the cause of a particularly great amount of stress on my parents. I feel as though it had, though it had it only been my brother who was causing issues in the family, my parents would have been more capable of handling him at home and he would have not, not been enrolled. So she's taking that on. How do you feel about your sibling's behavior and the things going on at home before she was at Evoke? A brother says, I was stressed and scared of my sibling's addiction. As it worsened, I also felt very helpless. A 19-year-old sister says, it was both amazing and sad to see how much power drugs can have on a person. It was impressive that my brother could could keep so many lies hidden from the family for so long. The behavior of my brother when he was high was actually a pleasant one, happy, enthusiastic, understanding. But it, but, but it was when he was beginning to withdraw, um, which was the unpleasant part. The crankiness, temper tantrums, being super defensive and yelling are all part of the bad side of my brother. He probably was led to lie more, steal, to lie more and steal, etc. when in that state of mind. What's it like to have a sibling in treatment? Were you surprised that your parents pulled the trigger and required this? What changes have you noticed in, at home since your brother or sister began wilderness? This is what a 13-year-old sister said. It's weird having a sibling in treatment, she said. It's not normal. I love this. It's not normal. I wasn't surprised when my parents sent her away because they told her they were going to do it, but she didn't believe them until it really happened. The house is a lot calmer now and more peaceful that my sister's not here. I'm feeling better. Not that I'm happy she's gone. I just feel relieved that she's gonna get better and not be the way that she was before. That's such a great comment from, from a sister. Are you concerned that you're next? I think that if I screw up like I did again, I'm most certainly next. If I don't, then I think it will be my decision if I leave home or not but I won't be enrolled at Evoke. That's what a 14-year-old sister said. I've learned with my four children to not threaten wilderness therapy because my oldest told me after he was in wilderness therapy that the constant threat over his head was too much to bear and finally he just blew everything up. In part, because it's better to sink your own boat 
than to deal with the anxiety that somebody else might sink it. And so although I ran a wilderness therapy program and it's virtually free to me to send my children, I, I've learned not to threaten them and, and create that, that. Really, when you threaten some, something like that, you're trying to, again, intimidate a child into cooperating. You're putting a, a, a virtual, metaphorical gun to their head, telling them that they'd better be good or else. And eventually, that pressure, that stress is going to be too much to bear. Somebody, next question. Do acquaintances share judgments about wilderness? Do you experience a sense of judgment or blame from others because your sibling, quote, needed, unquote, wilderness therapist, wilderness? How do you explain wilderness to friends? A 15-year-old brother answered it this way. A lot of times I don't explain to them that my sister is at wilderness program. I say she's at a boarding school. Only a few of my really close friends, the ones that knew my sister, know she's in a wilderness program. I've had it explained to some, I've had to explain, I have also, excuse me, I've also explained it to some of her friends. I don't feel a sense of blame when I explain it to people that my sister's in Willers. I explain Willers as a program in Utah where she receives therapy in the Willers, being completely isolated from the rest of the world. I used to explain to my non-identified patient children when her, their brother was in Willers, I used to say, he's in the mountains learning how to deal with his feelings or learning how to be happy. I spoke to them in a language they can understand. A 14-year-old sister answers the question about how she explains her or deals with her sibling being away with her peers. She says, my acquaintances and friends understand that my brother is a piece of work, to put it nicely. Most agree that he needed this kind of help for him to change. His old friends, whom I still see at school, are not too happy he's gone, though. They have little faith in the program, of course. Post-enrollment, what specific differences do you notice in how your parents act toward the identified patient? How about towards you? A 13-year-old sister said, my parents, especially my mom, feel bad for my sister. I get that. I feel bad for her too. But my mom forgot what my sister was really like when she was here, like nothing was wrong with her. She denies it. It's only because she misses her so much. My dad just wants her to get better. They act the same around me. And then a 14-year-old sister says, my mother seems to have become more embarrassed of my brother since he left, if that was possible. But she also talks more about how she loves him and misses him. Since he left, I think I've now become the bad kid, quote unquote. I guess without my brother here, they're, they're able to focus more on finding things that make me, quote, the worst of the litter now, unquote. If we don't learn to deal with our anxiety, we will find other people to blame for our, for our unhappiness. Part of growing up, and I'm speaking to us parents, is to realize that it is our relationship with life that will determine our happiness. It's how we're living our lives that leads to our happiness and our unhappiness. And if we don't learn that, we will blame our children and our spouses and others for our unhappiness. Next question. When you were asked to write an initial, were you asked to write an initial letter to your sibling? Did you want to write one? Did you feel it was welcomed? 13 year old sister says, I didn't write an initial letter, not because I had any shortage of writing material, but because I didn't know how to begin. Sometimes he's a great brother, but he has always been a ticking time bomb. And I have seen what he has done to my mother and how can that be forgiven? Also, I've always had a love for singing. <coughs> and find it difficult sometimes not to sing. However, if he catches me even humming in his presence, he reacts violently towards me. Once picked me up and threw me in the pool. Another time I was washing pots after dinner. I started to sing, and he pushed my head under the faucet, soaking me. I feel that before I had to watch my step around him, but now I can be more free. This is a great example where this child was exposed to trauma, and so forcing her into a treatment solution is to, again, kind of expose her or re -ex help her. It, it, it re-traumatizes her because you are taking away her freedom. 
I have learned as I've grown up as a parent, I have learned more and more and more to respect my children's boundaries, which include not telling me how they feel, not talking, spending more time in their room. Especially during the pandemic, I realized that as, as much time as we spend together, their, their room is their only solace. You know, the only, the only way that they can manage their own boundaries. If this intervention works, what do you think is clinic critically important for your sibling? Um, if this doesn't work, why do you think it doesn't? A 15 year old brother said, I think the most important thing for my sister is for her to be hundred percent honest with herself and face whatever is truly bothering her. If it doesn't work, I think she will, will still be lying to herself and trying to push away what's inside instead of facing it and acting and helping herself. A 21 year old twin brother said, if the intervention works, I think it's important that my brother is in the right place with good influences. I just want him to be happy. I don't think he should be surrounded around super around the superficial world until he is ready to handle it again. Like a gambling addict going back to a casino. Can he go in there without gambling? And finally, a 24 year old, year old brother says, I think su success depends on my brother understanding that it doesn't end with a vote. It also depends on my parents fostering an environment conducive to ongoing rehab recovery. I listened to a podcast today about a New York times, well, at least a contributing journalist to the New York times. Um, he wrote a book called, um, Oh shoot. What's it called? Ken is his name troubled. He also wrote, wrote a series of articles, I believe prior to reading the book and I listened to the podcast and he complained that in his wilderness therapy program some years ago, that parents weren't asked to do much work, weren't involved. He actually mentioned uh, Evoke by name at one point, actually the former name of our program by name at one point. And I wanted to, I wanted to yell through my headphones. Like the day that we opened up Evoke in 1998, we brought families into the field. We developed a family curriculum. I really think Evoke is a family intervention. And I think that the work that you learn when you're learning from your, your therapist on your weekly phone calls about how to respond to letters, you're learning about how to respond to the non-identified patient, how to listen, how to hold boundaries and where the two intersect. You're learning to listen. You know, that's the take home is learn to listen, learn how to sit with somebody else in their unsolvable problem. I'm going to say that again, learn how to sit with another person and their unsolvable problem. Learn how to distinguish between their needs and your needs. If you don't do your work, you won't know if it's your child's anxiety or yours. You won't know if it's their distress or yours. You'll confuse the two. Learn to have a different relationship with pain. It's okay. It's not broken. You can grieve at the same time that you're setting a really difficult boundary to send your child to a wilderness program. Learn what it means to take care of yourself because a lot of your anger and your resentment and your acting out, and I'm talking to the parent, is based on your lack of self-care and your hope and your dream that your child will take care of you. Therapy, meetings, education. I know there are a lot of questions and I'll get to them in my next broadcast, my Q&A about support for siblings. I will say this to you. Go do your own work first. Go to al -Anon, go to CODA, go to your therapy. My 13-year-old goes to therapy on and off. I don't require it at this point. Like I said, I, I may require a program later on, but I don't believe that outpatient therapy is a good thing to, to, to force in most cases. Um, but I go to therapy every, every week. And except for when I've traveled, I haven't missed... In 22 years, well, that's not exactly true. I've missed a few times in 22 years, but I go when, I, when I'm doing well and, and when I'm not because I'm trying to figure out how to be a father, and that's not specific to a certain diagnosis or, or gender or developmental stage. It's really about the fundamental aspects of being human. And so... We have opened up groups. We've had support groups for siblings. 
We've had groups in the field for siblings. And I will tell you this. Number one, they don't fill up and they don't fill up with the right people. They don't fill up with siblings who want it. They fill up with parents who want the siblings to want it. That's a very different thing. Or they, they fill up with, with, with siblings who probably need their own treatment program. We've seen that a lot. Do your work, work on yourself, find a community that can sit with you and love you in your unsolvable problem because none of us are going to be able to avoid pain and grief. None of us. But we can make it bearable by not being alone in it. All right, I know I've gone over. Like I said, I'll finish next week with the questions. My books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You, are available on Amazon and Audible. I read the audio version of the new book. If you are a current or former wilderness family, parents, the next um, support group is October 7th at 6.30 p.m. We have one each week on Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. If you are an alumni, this is not for current parents, but we also have a once-a-month alumni meeting. October 26th at 6.30 p.m. is the next one. And then, of course, if you are an intensive alumni, October 12th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Email malia at evoketherapy.com for more information. If you want to do your own work, basically everything I talked about tonight could lead to this. You might want to come to an intensive to help the sibling come to your own first. Come to your own first. Do finding you first. If you can't do it in person, our next in-person one that has any available spots is November 10th through 14th. Do an online one. It's less than half the cost and half the time. And it's from home. And it's over the weekend. Contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information. If you want an attachment-based therapy, um, if you want an attachment-based coach, coach, a, a coach that's that's educated in the evoke therapeutic way, then contact coaching at evoketherapy.com. We have pursuit trips also for families and young adults. We ask all current parents to go to six 12-step meetings, any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or adult children. Also, refugerecovery.org or nami.org are great resources for you if the 12 steps don't fit, fit for you. You can listen to all these broadcasts on your favorite so on your favorite podcast app, including Spotify. Just search Finding You, an Evoke Therapy podcast, or go to soundcloud.com and search the same thing, Finding You, an Evoke Therapy podcast. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy. You can also find us on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And then our Evoke Therapy blog has new content each week, beautifully curated by Malia Boyd. And I think our most recent one is from, from our therapist at, at Entrada. Brand, uh, Brand wrote a wonderful blog this week. I'm running an intensive this week and next, and then I have a vacation. So a little bit spotty in October, but my next broadcast will be a live Q&A for Evoke family and friends. Feel free to share this with the siblings if you feel comfortable or you can let them listen to afterwards. October 12th, that is a week from tomorrow, October 12th, or no, a week from tonight. At 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time, a live question and answer for you or anybody in your family or your close friends. Thank you for joining me. I hope this is a a a, a good, a helpful point of contact with you. Um, and I, I hope that, uh, well, I just want to thank you for and on behalf of all of your family. As I look at the list of people that are in attendance this evening, like I said, some old friends and some some newer people. Hi to my old friends and welcome to the new ones. I want to thank you for and on behalf of the people that you love and that love you for your willingness to do your work because that is the best and most loving thing you can do for everybody in your life is to work on yourself. So take care, folks. Have a great evening. and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.